Hi, this is Kelly Taylor. We are so happy, very tickled to have you join us today. Hopefully, you'll get a lot out of the service. It'll be great to see people that you know and can connect to. And we're just very, very happy that you're here. And make sure and, you know, hang out maybe afterwards and listen to what Robert's got to say at 11 o'clock. Thanks so much. You guys have a great day. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. So Jesus tells us, forgive 70 times seven times. Oh, man, that's hard spiritual work. And as followers of the person of Jesus, we are called to hard spiritual work. We get ready for that work by coming together and worshiping. Uh, this morning, it's morning prayers. Come in, join us, um, find a comfortable place. Welcome. If you're new to us, it's great. If you've been here forever, come on in. Uh, welcome. Oh, give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us all our sins through the Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, because without you we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Open our lips. And our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Worship the Lord in beauty of holiness. Come, let us adore him. Hallelujah. When Israel came out of Egypt, the house of Jacob, from a people of strange speech, Judah became God's sanctuary, and Israel his dominion. The sea beheld it and fled. Jordan turned and went back. The mountains skipped like rams, and the little hills like young sheep. What ailed you, O sea, that you fled? O Jordan, that you turned back? You mountains that you skipped like rams, you little hills like young sheep. Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob who turned the hard rock into a pool of water and flintstone into a flowing spring.
reading from the book of Exodus. The angel of God who was going before the Israelite army moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove back the sea by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them. All of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea. The waters formed a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Hello, everybody. So um, in thinking about gifts uh, and the gifts that we are given, um, maybe uh, you give your brother or sister or good friend or mom or dad a gift on their birthday. Maybe they give you a gift on your birthday. Um, I realize, and maybe you do too, that there are some gifts that are so big, we don't even notice them. Let me tell you what I mean. So, in the beginning, or maybe before the beginning, there wasn't much. In fact, there wasn't anything at all. Except maybe a big smile. But there wasn't anybody there to see it. I think God gave us a gift. On the first day, God gave us the gift of light. And so there wasn't just darkness, there was light. And I don't mean the light in like your flashlight or the light in your bedroom or even the light in your whole house. I mean all of the light that is light. And God saw the light and God said, it is good. On the second day, God gave us water. And I don't mean like the water in a hose or the water in a squirt gun or in your faucet. I mean all of the water that is water. This is the firmament. It separates the waters that are below from the waters that are above. God saw the water and said, 
It is good. On the third day, God gave us the gift of dry land. God separated the waters and the dry land and all the green things that grow on the land. And God saw the land and all the green things that grow. And God said, it is good. On the fourth day, God gave us a way to keep time. God separated the day and the night. Here is the light that rules the day. It is the sun. And here are the lights of the night, the moon and the stars. And God saw that we could keep time. And God said, it is good. On the fifth day, God gave us all the creatures that fly in the air. Not just the birds, but all the creatures that fly in the air. And God gave us all the creatures that swim in the sea. God saw the creatures in the air, and God saw the creatures that swim in the sea. And God said, it is good. On the sixth day, God gave us all the creatures that walk on the dry land. The creatures that walk with four legs and the creatures that walk with two. And God saw all these creatures that walk on the land and God saw all of the things that God had given us. And God said, it is very good. On the seventh day, God gave us the gift of rest. And this day is really special. It's different than the other days. Jewish people mark this day with two candles. Christians mark this day with a cross. This is the day where we learn how to rest. Now I wonder, which of these is your favorite day? I wonder if we could take away any of the days and still have everything that we need. Now watch as I put away the story seventh day, the sixth day, the fifth day, the fourth day, the third day, the second day. The first day and the great smile. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, 
And those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat. For God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall. And they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord. Since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand in the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. I will sing to the Lord, for he is lofty and uplifted. The horse and its rider has he hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my refuge. The Lord has become my Savior. This is my God, and I will praise him. God of my people, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a mighty warrior. Yahweh is his name. The chariots of Pharaoh and his army has he hurled into the sea. The finest of those who bear armor have been drowned in the Red Sea. said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed talents was brought to him, and as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. 
So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to the Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. <clears throat> from your heart. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. So the angel of the Lord took its place as a pillar of cloud by day or pillar of fire by night and went behind the army of Israel and stood between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. I speak to your name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So it's going to be with you all the way from Houston, Texas. I just want everybody to know that the format of worship that we used last Sunday where I'm vested and standing, we're, we are committed to that format. We're going to continue that. But um, since I'm all the way in Houston, you can't wear um, vestments in Houston because it's too hot. It's actually canonical law. It's way too hot. So nobody in Houston wears vestments. I mean, it's just ridiculous to do that. And so um, the humidity is so high here. So Courtney is standing in for us with vestments. So it's a good thing. So, um, so I, I love this concept that um, um, the godly play story uh, presents to us as, as creation as a gift, right? That, that God gives us these various sort of gifts in the way that we think about the great picture of our created existence in the world and our lives and the way that we get to love each other and the gratitude that comes along with that. And I think another gift that is sort of um, center in the life of uh, the faithful, both Christian and Jewish and Muslim, um, share this story about liberation through the Red Sea or the Sea of Reeds, depending on how you're looking at it. And the story stands pivotal, really, uh, in the uh, foundational stories of the people of God that is presented to us in the Hebrew scriptures. It is it's certainly central. It is um, uh, indicative of who they are to be, a people who trust God to show up on their behalf in the most crucial and dangerous moments. I'm reminded that when I was starting my work at St. Timothy's as a baby priest, not the old experienced priest that is stands before you or sits before you today, but as a, as a baby priest at St. Timothy's, I got up there and um, there was a lot of um, sort of conversations or even maybe, dare I say, conflict about sort of how to do um, Sunday school. I mean, of all the things to fight about, right? How we do Sunday school. And so um, the church had purchased for itself, I mean, over the years, over a decade or so, three full sets of godly play materials. Now, I, I just need you to know that that is no small investment. That is in the thousands of dollars investment. And, and so we, we have these tools, and but, but godly play as a curriculum had um, sort of ran its course there and had rubbed some folks the wrong way. And so we, had, we, were, we were focused or we were presented with this issue where we had all these godly play materials and yet um, people didn't want to do godly play. And so, so we got together with a couple of people and we were like, how, how are we going to do this? And somebody suggested, instead of calling it godly play, let's just call it God stories. And that worked. <laughs> so we, we called it God stories and we got some folks to train um, as adults about how to tell these stories. And the person that, that I tapped to do the training was Kathleen Kravass. She worked at, uh, works currently at the church 
the Good Shepherd. She's their children minister up there. Just a brilliant person and um, and very faithful, spiritually mature, and um, and and is immersed in godly play and sort of understands the philosophy behind it. Um, how you tell stories not by memory or rote, but by heart, by what's in your heart. Um, and so she comes and she does a training with, with a group of people. And, and one of the parents who was opposed to godly play asked this question of, to Kathleen. She said, uh, the parent said, um, so why do we have to tell these same stories over and over again? And, and it's one of these moments as a priest where, you know, you develop the voice that's in the back of your head versus the voice that actually comes out, right? Because the voice that comes out is, is something like, that's an interesting question. And the voice that's in the back of your head is like, what are you talking about? Of course we tell these stories to our children over and over again. But Kathleen, man, she can't do that as cool as a cucumber. She, she looked at the parent and she said, oh man, that is, that's a good question. And she thought about it for a second and she said, I think the reason that we tell these stories over and over again is because someday your child is going to be in front of the sea, the Red Sea, and they're going to look back and the army of Egypt is going to be breaking in on them. And they have to know for sure that God is going to cut a path through that Red Sea ahead of them. And of course, at that moment, you can hear a pin drop in the room. Right? It's like, oh my gosh, which is exactly right, which is why we have the gift of this story that the people of Israel, um, the Hebrew people for centuries, and now us as Christians too, for centuries have been formed by this notion that God is going to show up in these most anxious ridden times. And of course, the story that comes to us about um, the, the, the congregation of Israel, what the Bible calls an army, an army of Israel and the army of Egypt. So think about this. The Bible frames this as two opposing forces, forces, the force of the oppressed and the force of the oppressor right? Is there in the wilderness together in this awkward time? And the story comes to us not in a vacuum. You know, we, we've, we've led up to this moment where, um, where the people of Israel are um, hard pressed with labor um, because the Pharaoh has become um, frightened of them as foreigners who are going to do something nefarious. Nothing that they have done on their own behalf, but just because of the fact that they were different right? Pharaoh has become fearful of them and imposed upon them hard labor. And at one point um, has upped the brick quota. So the, the people of Israel have to find their own straws to make brick. And it's this very oppressive thing and hard labor. And it's impossible. And they're crying out. And Moses is sort of out on his own. And we've listened. We've heard the story. We've read the story where God comes to Moses in that strange fire of the bush and calls them back into community with his people as a force of liberation and goes down and confronts Pharaoh and um, offers Pharaoh's chance after chance after chance and Pharaoh's heart becomes hardened again and again and again. And we learn something about how oppression sort of works in the world in which it becomes more hard, more resolute in its, um, its ability and willingness to impose upon people um, hard labor um, for the sake of um, one, oppressing folks, and two, um, sort of an economic benefit, right? And Moses confronts and confronts and confronts, and Pharaoh refuses or refuses or refusal until there is this horrible plague that befalls Egypt in which the firstborn, the first life given, is lost. And we read the story yesterday about the Passover and the wiping of blood on the door on the, doors, uh, on the doorpost, and we read about how in the Seder meal that the people of Israel stand ready at all times, and they ritualize this over and over and over again. If, if you need to know more about it, just ask uh, Amy Sandy, who's a part of our congregation, who works for the, a local Jewish congregation. Um, people of Israel prepare for this, and they ritualize this over and over again to be ready, be ready for the thing that God is going to do in their midst. Right, to constantly be ready. And so God shows up and leads the people of Israel out into the wilderness. And what we get in this story is the story in front of the Red Sea. And that's how it's been handed to us. As um, and, and I think, I bet a lot of people who are listening to this right now, they've seen the Charleston Heston. And the, Charleston Heston, the one who played Moses. Is that right? Am I, 
am I remembering this correctly? I remember a cartoon in which the waters are parted and you can see it. You can see a big well behind the wall of the water, right? And that's the image we all have in our mind. The Bible might be doing something a little different. I'm not going to say that image is wrong. Don't hear that. But the Bible can also be interpreted in maybe another way. So there's, there's this sort of language thing that I'm not going to go into where the Sea of Leeds and the Red Sea, it's the same in Hebrew. And so we're wondering, we wonder as translators, how, how do you do this? How do you do this? But if we read it as the Sea of Reeds, then instead of this sort of dry place that where they come to a big, gigantic body of water, instead they find themselves in a marshland with mucky, terrible ground to try to trudge through and reeds popping up all around them. And at, at any moment, flooding can happen. And I think it's this setting that is more appropriate to our position now in the midst of a pandemic and um, an and election that is ripping us apart and the anxieties that come along that and the racial strife that is presenting itself in, in our country right now. Um, as this marshy, difficult to navigate place. And what I love about the story that we did not get today is that the Israelites have this line, and I think it's one of my favorite lines from all the Old Testament. Um, uh, you know, it's one of these things where you can just hear people saying, they, the, the Israelites are there in this marshy, terrible place, right? And they see that Egypt has changed, Pharaoh has changed his mind, and Egypt is, the army of Egypt is pursuing them into the wilderness. And they, they, they're looking at this army, and they turn around to Moses, and they say to Moses, this is the line, they say, were there not enough graves in Egypt that you had to bring us out here to die? Were there not enough graves in Egypt that you had to pull us out of here to die? You can just hear him saying that. Maybe we are saying something like that now, right? Were there not enough graves in our own anxiety-ridden lives that we've been pulled into this place of pandemic and racial strife and election strife and political strife to die, right? Were there not enough graves? I think about places like this where we are taken from one reality and pushed right into a stark different reality. One of those for me was um, um, when I first started as a, a college minister with uh, Project Canterbury, which is the college ministry for UTC. Um, man, I had no idea what I was doing. And so, you know, here I am, a 30 um, something guy trying to figure out how to minister with uh, 17, 18, 19, 20 year olds, right? And I think what I learned, one of the things I learned about myself is that I'm, I'm way more at ease with like boomers than I am with uh, uh, millennials and younger. I'm just, uh, I, I do not understand their spirituality or I'm trying to understand the spirituality of folks who are a lot younger than me. It's, it's like a foreign land. It's like, it's like the sea of reeds. It's like this mushy thing that you have to sort of navigate and wonder about it. There's a lot of context there and you have to kind of figure it out. But there I was with these college students and I thought, you know, what better thing to do than to provide an experience uh, that is not their cushy, comfortable experience here in 21st century United States. And so my good friend, John Talbert, had this vibrant ministry that he had helped build in Haiti. And so, so I worked with several churches in the diocese and we raised enough money to take five students, little cost to themselves, to Haiti. And we did this and we get there and we're in this place that is totally different. And immediately it becomes clear to me that I have no idea what I'm doing. Because um, instead of these students sort of moving into this posture of humility and thinking, oh, well, you know, I've got it so good. Instead, you know, they're asking all these weird questions about the place. And um, I, I remember one of the fights or arguments that we got into between sort of me and John and this group of students. We're, the students were all scandalized by how dirty Haiti was. They were like, why is there trash everywhere? Are these, do these people just, if, if, oh, maybe we should try to help them organize into groups to pick up the trash. And so, you, you know, you begin to explain about like, you see in the United States, taxes go towards um, trash services that, you know, there's this whole underpinning of society that allows us to enjoy these kind of, like, this is the whole point that we enjoy these, these privileges and benefits that Haitians do not get to enjoy. And they seem to be missing the point. But the person really missing the point was me. I was the one missing the point. 
which was these, this group of students were coming into this experience brand new to it. I had spent seven months in Peru. Um, I'd lived 15, 20 years, um, 10 years more in some cases. Um, and so I brought my own sort of experiences to the table. And what I was unable to do in that moment was to be present with them where they were and asking these tough questions. Moses and Miriam, who bring the people into the wilderness, become present with those people. The people ask Moses, were there not enough graves in Egypt that you had to drag us out here into the wilderness? And so the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire, that is the presence of God, is actualized to the ministry of the person Moses and Miriam and Aaron. These people who are willing to sacrifice themselves to be present with the people as they are, not with the people that who Moses hoped that they would be, not with the people who Moses knew that they could be, but with who they were. And that's how Moses met those folks. And that's how Moses brought the presence of the Almighty God into the wilderness with those folks. That presence of God who puts God's self in between the army of the oppressor and the army of the oppressed. And so we find ourselves in this place, right? This in-between place. I remember in Haiti, this moment came up that was really crucial in which here we were at this cathedral. And John Talbert, the priest, had been in Haiti in 2010 when the earthquake hit. He was there and um, was able to get home on an like a army cargo ship um, through the embassy. But um, so, so John had been through it, had been through it with people, had literally been through it with people in Haiti. And so we walk over to the cathedral. The cathedral has collapsed from the earthquake. This is almost 10 years later. The, 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 earthquake, the earthquake had collapsed through the cathedral in Port-au-Prince. And, and we're standing in the ruin of this cathedral looking at it. And people had drug the materials um, that had fallen from the cathedral and built shanty homes at the edge of the cathedral. And people were living in these concrete um, impromptu structures that they had set up there. And so we're walking through and we're noticing all this. And I'm looking over at two of my students that are coming with us in the trip and tears are welling in their eyes. And this woman comes to us and she's speaking Creole um, in a exaggerated tone of anguish, begging, just begging. She has two children at her feet and a baby in her arms. And we are able to do nothing for this woman, nothing. And that was a breaking point for those students. It was a breaking point. And when we came together that night to talk about it, the students were between right out despair and write out anger about being present, but not being able to do anything, right? And we talked about the power of presence, the power of presence, of being there, of just being, to be witnesses to it, to seeing it, to putting ourselves in that place, right? This is what Moses does. He leaves his life as a um, shepherd and comfortable life with Jethro there, and he makes his way to confront Pharaoh and to be present with the people of God. And it is this presence, this being with, that allows the presence of the Almighty God to be in their midst and to cut open a path. And the story is rich with imagery from um, creation and birth, the waters that open up, right, and the the breath, the spirit of the almighty God that separates the water. This is the same Ruha that was breathed in creation over the fathomless deep that brought about the created word, right? So God is being present, is creating a people through this action. And so we learn a couple of things about what happens to the Israelites. We learn that in this in-between moment in the wilderness, we learn that the, the weapons of the oppressor, the chariots, become their weakness as their wheels get stuck in the muck, right? We learn that um, 
the only thing that is called upon the people of Israel in that moment is to trust that the presence of God is going to bring them through that moment as a new people. And we also learn that in these moments that there is a cost, that there is a death that might happen in which the people of Egypt falls in to the sea and are lost. That's what we learn, that there's sacrifice in these moments. And when Israelites and Hebrew people tell these stories to their children over and over and over again over the centuries. Egypt hasn't gone anywhere. It's still there. And so is the great power of Babylon and Assyria. These great anxieties still exist, just like anxieties exist in our own lives. But what the people are reminded of in telling the story over and over mm -hmm. again is that when those anxieties come, God presents God's self in a liberating kind of way. Right? And so I wonder what our call is. Um, one of those students who was with us in Haiti um, graduated from college and wondered what the next step was. And because of that experience in Haiti, um, joined the Peace Corps and spent two years in Costa Rica. Right? Um, knowing that um, what God is demanding of us and her own sort of millennial spirituality there, what God is demanding of us is to be present be present. Maybe in this mucky, strange sea of reeds time of the pandemic and election strife and, um, and racial strife, maybe there is a call like Moses to bring the Holy Spirit with us into conversation and presence with each other. And that's being presented to us in this ironic way of not being able to be physically present with each other, which is a way of realizing the sacrifice of not being physically together and the importance of finding ways to be truly with each other despite our differences. And it is being with each other, even when a group of people are complaining about losing graves in Egypt for the graves in the wilderness, right? Whenever, even when a group of people do not fit sort of our own pro proclivities, proclivities, that um, this is an opportunity to be truly present, be truly present. And that's how the Holy Spirit shows up. That's where God sort of comes in in these moments. And so we get to stand here together as a people, right, realizing that um, it is together, it is together that we look back upon the army of Egypt that is upon us now. And it is together that we trust that God comes between us in those anxieties and that God will open a path across the sea. Amen. Okay, so I've got some announcements yeah, that I need to share with you. One is um, that right after this service, um, there is an adult forum in which we are talking about Eucharist and the real presence of God in the Eucharist. And um, we get an opportunity to have a conversation about that in terms of our own experiences of communion and Eucharist, but also sort of what it looks like in terms of um, um, the church and the history of the church and theology and those sorts of things. So uh, come join us right after this service for that conversation. The link to that can be found in the, in the email that comes out um, from uh, the church, either St. Thaddeus or St. Albans. Um, we were going to try to do a passing of the peace over Zoom today, and um, because of some technical difficulties, we're unable to, to do that. What I want you to know is that we are committed um, to providing the kind of liturgical format that we did sort of last Sunday, where we, we have the Eucharist and I'm vested and we're together, and we're gonna add the piece to that. So because of sort of what's going on in the world, we're not gonna be able to do that until October the 4th. Um, next Sunday, I will be driving home from Texas, Gaines and Bill will lead the service next Sunday. Um, the Sunday after that is in, the 27th is an important day. It's an agape meal um, gathering, a parish forum. And so we will have both the Thaddeus and the St. Albans parish forum. And I invite you to come and be a part of that. And the way that looks is that, um, get your brunch or your breakfast or your um, or your second breakfast or whatever, whatever you want to call it at 10 o'clock. Um, come around a table and um, join. Um, there will be a, a, a webinar that comes out, a Zoom webinar. 
thing you'll see. And we're, we're going we're gonna to do some prayers and read some scripture, but we're also going to talk about the state of our parish, and it's going to be an interactive conversation. Um, so that's on September the 27th. So um, on October 4th, we will do the passing of the peace, and what it will look like is um, you will come, and you'll be, if you're a part of the Zoom webinar, uh, then your, your little square um, video will be um, posted live, and you will get to interact with everybody else on the Zoom webinar. So we welcome you to come and join that. So what you need to know about that is when we get to that point and we do that, whatever is on your video will be out there for, for folks to see. So you just need to, you need to be aware that, that that's going to happen. So um, I'm sorry we were unable to sort of bring that to bear today, but there, there's some major technical things that are going on behind the scenes today that didn't allow us to do that. But I say to you, the peaceful Lord be always with you. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Blessed Christ, we believe that you are present in the Holy Eucharist. We continue to grow in love for you above all things, and we desire to receive you. We also desire to be together to share in the sacrament. As we cannot now receive you in Holy Eucharist, we know that you come spiritually into our hearts. We embrace you as if you were already there and unite ourselves to you until we can gather again. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Spirit, we give honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Today, we especially remember all the folks who are on our prayer lists. Uh, we pray with special intention for Victoria. We also pray remembering this week um, the victims of the 9-11 um, um, terrorist attack. And we, we pray for all people around the world who fall victim to religious and political violence. And we also pray with great thanksgiving for the people who rushed in uh, to be uh, first responders and rescuers. Um, to risk their own lives. And we pray for those people who continue to do that work. I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Jesus Christ our Lord. And so the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you now and remain with you always. 
Amen. Hallelujah. Go forth into the world to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for worship this morning. If you notice, this morning we uh, passed the peace in a way we haven't in a long time and filled our hearts with joy. Um, we also uh, made the general thanksgiving in which we remember the many things that God does in our own lives and the many ways that God shows up. Tomorrow is the Feast of the Holy Cross in which uh, we move from this experience into um, the part of our Christianity in which we are called to remember the many ways in which we are asked to take on small sacrifices um, so that our baptismal covenants can be realized in the world um, so that we can honor the dignity of every human being. Um, we ask, I ask that um, you remember that as you head into this feast day. Maybe um, go on to lectionary.com and just check out the readings for that. Thanks everyone, we'll see you in a week.